doesn't matter, um, both uh, basically anything which helps with uh, customers um, uh, being successful on the Azure uh, AI stack, um, Azure ML, Databricks, um, and the cognitive services, which is the AI portfolio, which is like the turnkey AI solutions. And before I start, by show of hands, how many of you are in the field of ML or ML practitioner, data scientist? Awesome, perfect. And how many of you are software engineers, like app developers? Perfect. And how many of you are like mostly on the data engineer side? And all right, perfect. So we have a very good mix of the room. And how many of you are not from technology, or like mostly from business? Or all right, perfect. Awesome. So we have a um, mix of everyone and more focus on the data science. Awesome. So it's more on the data science side and as well, but because of, again, we have 30 minutes and is it really on the high levels today? We want to focus on the high levels. We do not really have time to go super deep. Um, and as well, we have a very tight agenda. So I hope that we can target all of them by the end of the 30 minutes. Um, so I have my clock here. So it actually is now six o'clock. So really short on time. I try to finish it by 6.30. Um, do we have any Q&A time after that? Or I have to like have uh, 30 minutes also considering the Q&A time? Maybe for you, Alexa. Oh, yeah. So can we have like a Q&A after 30 minutes? Or no, it has to be inside the 30 minutes for Q&A. After 30 minutes. Okay, perfect. So we can have maybe 10 minutes at the end for uh, Q&A. Perfect. Uh, so we're going to start with the... LLMs, uh, what are the LLMs and why actually LLMs are important and why do we have to care? Um, so really LLMs are basically multitask models. Um, so basically they can receive instructions from the end user in natural language or other modalities like for instance image or speech or audio. And uh, basically and perform those actions similar to the way that you would communicate, communicate that to your colleague, right? So for instance, this is an example of a custom uh, conversation uh, where you're asking, you're basically telling the LLM model that write a follow-up email given the following conversation. A customer conversation goes as basically, hi, something, and then continues with the actual conversation. Let's say it's a very lengthy conversation, which is a very common one in a call center or something. And then it sends to the LLM, and LLM just understands the instruction, the context, and comes back with an email. So it could be anything else, right? So it could be basically any other task or combination of it. So you could ask, write an email, extract the name, do X, Y, and Z, and then it will do it for you. And, and, and a good, cool fact about this is that it's all in basically natural language, in English, French, or any other language that you speak, right? It's not in any programming language, right? So at the beginning that I started using this, it was, super, it was disappointingly simple, right? For me, coming from an ML background, we like to work with the complex stuff, so that is basically a barrier for entry. This is actually super simple. So you can, almost everyone who has access to an LLM can actually start to talk to it, and you can perform tasks. So you, can not, you don't have to do any Python programming or any model tuning or anything like that, and it actually works off the shelf for many of the tasks. Still, um, thankfully, still some downstream application that you can do some data science stuff and ML stuff, but like really many of the models, like maybe uh, just few lines of code in any language, you kind of start using it just off the shelf, and that's super simple. But that's really the LLM, right? Including OpenAI, which is like the leading LLM uh, provider, but like the rest of the open source and non-open source LLMs basically is in the realm of the same line. But why do we care? Um, so I, just a little bit of history again, because you are coming from the ML background, but those who are not. Um, Little bit of history about basically how we got here. Again, these are like some of the dates. We can argue that they were like different dates, but like these are really when they would actually were uh, materialized in a commercial sense. So it was literally in a basically late 90s where like machine learning actually started to be in the applications or basically like started really with the spam filtering in the late 90s, a very, very simple rule, uh, basically based systems and ML, ML based systems. But again, in the uh, 2016, it was late 2015, where TensorFlow basically got us to the first version, a better version, if you remember. I still remember working with the better version in like November 2015, I think, it was just released. Um, uh, but really in the 2016, 2017, it was got commercialized. So before that, it was really in the 
uh, basically labs, research lab prior to that, you had to write your own kernel activation function. I remember everyone had a, its own library of neural networks, but then it now it becomes like few lines of code and it can very basically be a very sophisticated deep learning model um, in PyTorch or like a TensorFlow or, or JAX or other languages. And in 2020, basically GPT-3 was basically released. We had GPT-2 before that. It was still a generative model, was not really practical, but it was really 2020 and 2021 where GPT-3 became actually very mainstream and it was practical and the startups started to use the API off the shelves and it actually became important. And it was late 2022 where after chat GPT became really important, right? Before that was a small number of companies and startups actually realized the importance of GPT model. Um, but again, after maybe two years uh, down the line, it actually now become very important and everyone is talking about chat GPT and other stuff. It was really, really in um, um, uh, early 2021, it was basically the first release of the GPT-3 models and later GPT-3.5 models. But that's really the journey of that and basically stacked up on each other from rule-based expert system all the way to generative model, which you can generate images or like text out of thin air and we really um, just do very interesting stuff, which nobody actually expected that. Anyone in the science field, if you go back like five years ago and read about the predictions, everyone would expect this to happen in 100 years, not now, right? Um, it's really interesting to see how it's gonna evolve in five years. Uh, but really before this, I just have to basically share why again is important, just to appreciate the fact of uh, what these LLM models, especially the GPT models, actually were able to accomplish. So before really the, the transformer architecture was released in the attention all we need, um, um, the, the way to do build machine learning models was very, very slow and, and tedious. And some of the models would take six months to a year to really get to the actual uh, deployment. Um, so you would have to start with tagging the data. For instance, if you wanted to build an image classifier to detect whether an image is a rose or not, um, you had to basically start to collect 10,000 to 100,000 of rose images and non-rose images. So you had to have the labeled data in advance. So it would be very massive undertaking to just paper the data. Then you had to go through the basically training phase to just do basically going through a lot of hyperparameter tuning and building the models from scratch mostly CNN models and, and models of, of, of that type. And prior to that, um, basically um, like very, I mean, rule-based system, but, uh, but, but the ML world, like again, very basically again, uh, hyperparameter tuning from scratch and learning very the basics of like understanding pixels, edges and everything all the way to the uh, basically um, uh, from very ab high abstractions to low abstractions of the data. And then after that, you can actually see, okay, this is an image classifier, which rows versus non roses, right? Um, or um, uh, a text model, which is able to understand positive or negative sentiments. After again, collecting thousands of hundreds of thousands of positive negative sentiments from the text to be able to build a sentiment classifier. And that would take roughly about months to six months, sometimes to a year to get to a very good model. And imagine after, um, six months of building that sentiment model and someone comes back and say, I don't want, I want positive, negative, I also want a neutral. You have to go back, start to again, collect the data, go through the model hyperparameter tuning and again, going to the final model. That was a very tedious operation, right? And, and, and that was actually, sometimes you realize, okay, the data is not good again. There were like so many duplicates, so, so many basically null data again, you had to go back and it was super, super slow. Um, but something happened in 2018 uh, which basically allows everyone to become a lot more agile in their model development life cycle. And that was basically by introduction of foundation models, primarily by the transformer architecture, which is actually the core architecture for anything has been built after that, including the GPT uh, models and all of the LLM models. I basically literally copy and paste of the core architecture with some secret sauce, which is mostly on the parameter size, token size, that's mostly, and the data not the actual core architecture. And that allowed to basically us to build foundation models. And the foundation model didn't really need any labeled data. It was self-supervised. So we just throw Wikipedia data and we'll be able to basically come up with some um, uh, creative method to um, uh, build some sort of foundation model to be able to understand 
the core archi core basically a uh, foundation of data. So for instance, would it be able to understand text language of English, for instance, like words, how the sentences started, how sentences end, basically the capital letter, lowercase letter, and basically uh, things of those sort. Or images, it will be able to understand the edges, the colors, the patterns of the pixels, and basically will be able to become expert of images, right? But it was not expert on the roses, but it was expert on the images, right? It would understand the down, basically, understanding of the core understanding of the modality of the data or your pace, pass, pass, uh, uh, passing to it. Or sometimes they're like multimodals, like you would be able to understand text and images and at the same time and just understanding, but just understanding the data. Um, you would basically get the model and then it will go through an adaptation phase. So let's say you would get a core um, image uh, language model, like a burst model, for instance, which is like very popular, still very popular and very practical. And uh, you would basically get that and they would basically provide just a few examples, maybe hundreds or thousands of, of, of basically sentiment, like positive, neutral, or negative. And then you would go through this adaptation phase or fine tuning and it will get your sentiment analysis, for instance, right? So instead of, again, hundreds of thousands of examples, and maybe months of, or, or, or basically weeks of training, you will down to 30 minutes of training or an hour of training on a very small GPU, like not even a very heavy GPU. You will be able to get it to a very good model and after like maybe 30 minutes or two hours or three hours of training, which is very reasonable, right? And it could work really iterate super fast on it. And the heavy lifting was done here to build this foundation model, which might take like weeks or, 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 or months, or like provided like Google, Microsoft, or Meta, or other companies to provide that on their massive basically clusters and then make them available on like hugging face or other places. And then you can take them and, and fine tune it for them. So that was a huge, huge progress um, on the model uh, basically life cycle. Um, which again, reduced down from months of training to maybe hours of training, right? And almost everyone can get like hundreds of examples, right? To just to start with a very fast, quick prototype and, uh, and basically get the final model out. Um, but then uh, something interesting happened, which was actually at the early 2020, uh, uh, mid 2020, but the release of GPT-3 model, GPT-2 was slightly capable, but it was like super weak from that sense. But in GPT-3 actually became really materialized and then showed the promising aspects of large language models, really large, like a billion size parameters. And actually like add, that actually incentivized many to just go ahead and build um, their own and like open source many of them. But that was really, uh, the, what, it, what was the core functionality? And that was having a single model, which you don't need to do any adaptation, we're just taking them out of the office shelf, similar to that initial LLM example that I showed, and you can perform those tasks without just doing any training. And that's actually massive, right? So instead of doing the adaptation and build a single sentiment analytics or sentiment analyzer or like topic modeler or like summarizer, you can a single model which performs all of them at the same time. And uh, so this is basically is like similar to us, right? We use the same brain to do driving and as well to become a doctor, right? So we don't have like two brains, but we have a single brain. So same concept, you have a single model which is able to perform multiple tasks. Like in GPT-4, like even text and image, right? And still is not public, but like that is also another capability, which again is like multimodal, very complex type of understanding of both modalities, still with a single brain, right? It's still very magical. And, uh, and, and just with a few basically examples, like maybe just uh, zero shot or few shot learning and just providing something in context, you can as well like even improve the model again without any fine tuning needed. And like, again, that means zero time spent and zero GPU hours spent on fine tuning, data science resource on fine tuning. You can use your data science resources to just get to the best prompt to basically run it on your data. And again, GPT models are accessible through API, but like, Open source LLMs, you can just load it on your own, uh, basically compute directly. But it can be with that, you'll be able to send your data to it and basically get the basic all of these tasks done again um, with a single model. And that's really where it is important. And again, in simply speaking, that's really the main value proposition of large language models and why large language models are important, especially like the leading one, the open AI model, which again, previously you didn't have narrow models which are only good for a single task versus a single model which can perform so many tasks as one, right? Doing coding, like 
becoming a lawyer, like answering, basically becoming a lawyer, basically passing the lawyer exams, or at the same time, write an email, give in a conference, look at almost everything you can do with a single M model. And that's really the main value proposition of large language models. And what are these basically GPTX models? So GPTX models are basically autoregressive language models, which are again, trained on hundreds of millions to billions of tokens, um, which again, we can think of tokens as words, uh, with basically billion size, some again, arguably for GPT-4, we haven't really released anything about that, but like in about trillions of parameter size for larger language models, which means that it can be able to perform a lot of tasks uh, basically be again a single model and um, you can basically um, uh, compress a lot of data into his brain. And you can, you can think about that decoder model as like a very good compressor. And the better the compressor is, so the, the less it loses the information, the better is the model. Um, and as well, uh, basically like a very huge knowledge base, we can think about it. Like similar to chat GPT, you could talk to it, it knows almost about everything, right? Because it's basically has retained a lot of information. Sometimes it just hallucinates, like means just throws wrong information, but still it's really good for many of the basically examples. Now let's basically, again, just in order to show uh, that, to be able to really appreciate the, um, basically the importance of it, I wanna show you a very quick example of that in the playground. So again, this is like a Azure OpenAI, similar to the public OpenAI from interface perspective, but you can deploy this within your own subscription. So again, it becomes like a kind of a private, um, secure kind of a version of OpenAI within your Azure instance and Azure tenants. And in this example, I'm actually getting um, um, conversation, um, basically chat conversation between a call agent and a customer. Let me see how much time do I have? Okay, 15, that's not bad. All right, so this is a typical conversation. I wanna show you basically how you can use, again, OpenAI very quickly to just extract some information. Again, previously it would require like hours or months of training to be able to perform the same task, not even close to this. Uh, so this is again call converse. This is a conversation between Tom and Emily. Tom is a customer, and Emily is a call agent. Tom basically is contacting about a policy submission. It was an insurance basic example. He actually used ChatGPT to to write this. It's like a fake conversation, um, and uh, you can actually. So um, Tom is complaining about a rejection of a claim. Right, he submitted a claim. It was rejected because the police report wasn't available. Emily checks it and finds out. Okay, that is available, and then. We basically inform, uh, informs Tom that you have to go and submit your police report, and then he will leave happily. As part of the conversation, he's actually super unhappy. He basically is concerned to switch to another provider, and uh, basically some other information provides down the line. So now, what I want to do, I want to actually extract some information from this body of text. Let me actually zoom in a little bit more uh, so you can better see it. Um, yeah, so what I want to do, I want to extract the reason for the call, the cause of the incident, the name of the caller, account number, claim number, follow-up flag, and a short yet detailed summary of the conversation. Um, so again, previously, I emphasize on this because you're coming from ML world, and that's really something that is very, I mean, important to pay attention to, and that is previously you need to have at least seven models, at least, to be able to accomplish this, seven narrowly built models. But now again, with a single model, with just instructions, I can build it. I can add so many other things as well to this list. And I'll go ahead and ask that for one to four, I want to, the answer to be a short answer. For number six, it has to be a Boolean, whether follow-up is needed or not. And at the end, I say that it has to be in JSON format, so I can save it in a, maybe a document database like Cosmos or like um, uh, MongoDB or like other type of databases and then use it for reporting purposes, for instance, right? So all of them, again, with no programming needed, right? Just no Python, no nothing, right? It's just literally write it in English and then get the answers back. Um, and I just hit generate. Um, again, I hope that it works because internal employees have limited throughput. Okay, good. Uh, awesome. Sometimes uh, it just uh, tells me that, hey, you cannot do it now, do it later. Uh, but yeah, thankfully, uh, the support team likes you guys, so <laughs> we got the exception here. Awesome. So 
it basically comes back with the reason is the claim issue, right? The customer had a claim issue. Uh, the cause is a police report is missing. Caller is Tom. Account ID is an A or is not available because there's no account ID, but there's a claim ID in it. Provides it or knows like because firmware text again it easily kept, captures that. Follow up is needed and then finally the summary. And again, it will be taking so long to really get to this. And again, I can continue and change this. Let's say I'm happy, but then I want to add some some extra information. I want to collect the sentiment and like some churn related information. Again, I will be able to add this. Uh, let's change it to nine and oops, eight and uh, nine. I promise I know how to count. And uh, there we go. So again, I'm basically asking, just adding two more parameters. I just give me the sentiment and churn. And again, there's nothing secret about the one what I wrote. Um, it's basically um, just we can write it in any other way, right? But just but this is the way that I'm just choosing to write. And again, it uses the keys that I provided here, and again knows exactly what it means for JSON, so how to format it this way, and etc. So again, this is again one of the tasks that I'm doing here. We can just do many other things as well. And and one one interesting thing is that I'm actually asking whether churn was discussed during the conversation. The answer is yes. So it was basically discussed. And again, this is like a very common thing for the end of, end of data sciences, right? Churn problem detection or churn from a call, right? This is like something that you can easily get it from the model off the shelves. Again, no tuning is needed. And again, I'm using this Dobbin Chi 003, which is a most powerful. Uh, uh, version of uh, GPT-3 and uh, is basically using that to train, but you can use a GPT-4 as well, which is more powerful and uh, much longer context. Perfect. So going back to this. Some of the considerations for choosing OpenAI or basically going to um, maybe open source models. So these are like some of the considerations you need to have in mind. These are like some design considerations and uh, you either need to live with it or you need to basically completely, basically, if there's like some of these which are like deal breakers, you need to consider switching to open source LLMs inside Azure, for instance. Um, so the first thing is that you need to access it through API. So the, the, once you deploy the OpenAI Institute environment, it doesn't come to your data. Your data has to come to the API and you need to think about that latency, like a T for those who've been like um, working distributed computing, the T is like a time, which is actually something very important, especially for scale, that needs to factor in in your equation when you want to basically use it. The, you don't have access to the model weights, so it's completely uh, closed source, so you don't have access to any of the source code or any of the model weights. So if you want to do, perform any kind of a um, um, like attention mechanism, how basically tokens are basically talking to each other or things like that. You cannot get it for regulatory purposes. You cannot get that information from the OpenAI models. Um, uh, you can protect it through the basically VNets, uh, private endpoints, and basically all of the good stuff related to networking. Anyone from networking or infrastructure? All right, perfect, so you can, all right, so you can relate to this. And, uh, and the other one is, is available in only four regions, two in the US, one in Netherlands, and one in France. So let's say if you have a data residency issues, you cannot send the data across the border. That's again something you need to consider. So the data has to go to the US and come back. Again, all through your private network, it doesn't go to the internet. But again, it has to cross the border sometimes from contractual limitations. You cannot do that, for instance. And finally, there are some default token per minute and request per minute. That's again something you need to be very careful when you want to choose your use case. And they, these are default because you can send some requests to increase the coda. But like depending on the model type and uh, basically the complexity of it, you will get different type of tokens uh, per minute or tokens per request per minute. So it means that how many tokens it can process per minute and how many requests you can send to it per minute. These are the two very important factors. Let's say if you want to send it through a distributed engine, like if you have a massive cluster, every node wants to send the data to the API and get the result back. You need to know that if you have 20 clusters, each of them have 20 cores, it will be a massive submission to the API. It definitely will get a rate limit issue, right? So you need to basically work around that and make sure that you have enough pauses, enough delays, so that you can go through all of the data without any exception. Um, Awesome. So again, um, um, the other thing is a fine tuning as well. So you can do fine tuning, but um, 
fine tuning is something that um, in GPT-4 is not available because a multi-model, very complex model and fine tuning that is a whole different league, but you can do fine tuning on GPT-3 and onward because it gets more and more multimodal, at least for the massive and most strong model, you cannot actually use um, the model to fine tune. However, you don't have to fine tune it for majority of use cases. You can use in context learning to be able to make the model actually a smart. In other words, you can provide some examples inside the prompt as you use the model, so the model understands what you're actually asking for and basically becomes better. So for instance, in this example, there are like three ways that you can access the model. One way is basically your um, basically request and the data, and you basically ask it to perform some options, so some operations. In the second one, it's called fuchsia learning. Again, instead of fine tuning the model, you can do fuchsia learning where you can provide some examples. You can say, hey, just given this commentary, um, uh, basically just provide a, a commentary uh, and give me the highlights and you provide some examples. These are some of the examples of the commentary and the main highlights was. And then because you provided some examples, it exactly knows what type of thing you're looking for and then it comes back with the answer for basically the um, um, uh, basically response that you want. And if that doesn't work, then you can go through the fine tuning again for certain model types. You can do fine tuning, not all of the model types, and uh, but that is something possible that you can use. And once you do that, you will get a version of GPT model again, like most all of them are GPT three, but it will get an instance of that deployed inside your environment. So you would basically host it within your environment for you, and nobody else has access to it. I'm gonna pass this because there's some of the examples. The other way that you can use the LLM models, including open AI, is through the embeddings, basically. The embeddings are also another way that you can actually use the model. Um, the reason you need embeddings for those who are not from the ML background, basically converts your data from non-numerical to numerical, right? And then you can perform a lot of arithmetic operations. You can basically start to understand info interesting information from it. So let's say if you have king and queen is a very common example, and Paris, King and queen are similar to each other, more similar than Paris, right? But if you pass it to a machine that doesn't understand, right? It's basically text, right? But if you convert the king and queen to one and three, for instance, and then Paris to 100, just having these basically three numbers, very simple, it knows that it's very clear that these two are similar, like king and queen, than Paris which is like 100 away from king, for instance, right? Um, so the same applies again to the embeddings. Embeddings exactly does that. It converts the number into a string or an array of strings, even from a bag of words, very simple language models, all the way to like a word to vec, which was very big in 2015s, the 2015s, and, and now to these GPT models or LLM models, you can convert an input into an array of numbers. And again, what that help, helps you to do, you basically can, you can be, perform very interesting stuff. For instance, you can do um, topic modeling or clustering, for instance, on your data. You can throw all of the data into like a maybe a clustering algorithm and start to basically explore how, which are basically the documents are similar, more similar than each other and perform some interesting operations. Or you can build a search system, a very powerful search system. So for instance, for a given embedding, you can find out which of the other embeddings are closer or more similar to this and build an embedding-based search system. And in fact, the best embedding search systems are embedding bases. Some of them are like very textual, which are not very performant, but the best search systems are embedding systems. So if you have all of your historical data converted to embeddings, saved in something called vector database, then you can perform vector operations on it. So for instance, you can say for a given document, through some sort of a um, arithmetic distance method, like cosine, for instance, similarity, you can get uh, basically the documents are closer to that query or search, search query that you have actually submitted to the system. Um, and again, you're, I mean, the sky is the limit and that's something that the data science is stuff. So um, still is some room for innovations for our data scientists. Uh, but again, that's actually very powerful. And if you want to build any semantic search system on top of OpenAI or other LLMs, that's the way to do, and you need to convert your data into embeddings and then basically build an embedding system on top of it. So this is like a very like a, like a high level example of how the embeddings look like. At the time check, I have two minutes. Can we extend or no, I have to have a sharp. Okay, perfect. 
Oh, this is like an example of like an uh, basically uh, architecture. And uh, you would have basically your data. Um, like let's say you have PDF documents and everything else. You need to first convert it to text. Then you would have to pass it through the embedding endpoints of OpenAI or other LLMs. You can, of course, use that. Save the data in a kind of a vector database, like in Azure, it's called Cognitive Search, for instance. Or you can use Redis or like Pinecorn, like an open source um, uh, vector database, and make it available here. So for any given question, you would basically perform some like um, KNN um, and get, get basically the basically nearest neighbors, and then get the most the, the closest or the most similar documents to that question, and then send it to the user. As a result, basically becomes like a very interesting search system. In addition to that, what you can do, you can actually pass that top like three, for instance, data, pass it to OpenAI with the question, so you can reason on top of the data. So that's actually um, how you can build a chat GPT-like application for yourself. Um, so again, very quickly, this is an example of that exact same thing. So behind this, there are so many PDF documents. And we can ask questions about the PDF document. So every time you submit a question, it searches, gets the most relevant documents, sends it to OpenAI with your question, and it comes back with the answer as if you're talking to a human, and that human knows all of the information you have in your database, right? You can build basically a knowledge base or basically knowledge mining system literally in a weekend, right? It's super, super easy to do that now. Um, so uh, we can basically, for instance, ask about this, like this is like an insurance example that you ask about what is available in North uh, Health Plus. And instead of throwing you a link and then you have to go and figure it out yourself, it knows the information is already sent to it with your question. It reasons on top of it and gives you back the answer that this offers more comprehensive coverage and et cetera. And of course, it has the link to it so you can go and find it yourself. So that's actually something you can build, for instance, for your internal like a call agent, for instance, or you have an advisor for the wealth management system, this can come in as an agent, as a helper to the agent as they're on the call. We don't recommend this to just be served directly to the customer because sometimes you could throw wrong information, but it can really help the agents to become 10x, 100x more productive in their day-to-day -day operation. I can continue like then what is available in standard And again, it knows my previous example in answer, it knows the current answer, and then it comes back with, I mean, standard offers this and that. Uh, however, it doesn't offer this and this, for instance. Exactly as a human expert on your documents, right? Again, it becomes very interesting from that aspect. And again, that's again another application of, again, both open source and non open source, like um, GPT models. Um, and of course, like, again, GPT models are more accurate than the open source models, but it's still to try to proxy. Um, the uh, open source models, uh, the, the basically um, non-open um, non source models like GPT models. I will go through two slides and then I will pause. Um, so now you, let's talk about the open source LLMs. So now first talk about why you would choose open source LLMs over like something like ChatGPT. So uh, your data is too sensitive that you cannot, for instance, send it across the border. So right, so with some contractual limitations, you can basically you have to keep it here. Or let's say you have a data center and the data has to stay in your data center, right? So you have to host your model inside the data center because you cannot send it to a cloud provider like Azure um, to be able to process here, right? So that's basically one of the requirements. The other thing is that you want to have full flexibility over fine tuning the model. You want to have access to the weights, the parameters, and you want to basically fine tune it the best possible way, study that and basically improve it. So you want to have that level of access. Uh, you can deal with the latency. So let's say you want to process billions of records and you want to get that as fast as possible. So instead of, again, in the initial pattern that I described, you have to send the data to the API. You want to bring the model to your data, right? So let's say you have billions of records. You want to run it through a Spark. We have a massive cluster. You will load the model on all of the nodes of the Spark in the LLM models, right? So that it becomes like super, super fast. So you can run it through that. And um, GPTX models are too capable, right? Sometimes you do not want a person who is like expert in math, expert in law, expert in like um, a big expert doctor, right? You don't want that person. You want someone who is expert in only one thing and only one thing. So that's also another consideration you want to have. Um, yeah, so that's it. And as I like how you would choose the best model, uh, that's also another thing. So there are so many models available today. 
and every day comes like a new model comes up. Like literally in the past week, I had like super super interesting breakthroughs, uh, which like one model comes better than after the other. So these are like the two, the, the first two things are most important: model size, like total parameter, like some of them are seventy billion, some of them are forty billion, some of them are like hundred billion. That also like really helps to understand the more larger models tend to be better. Right, it's not always the case with tend to be better. The other thing is token size. Sometimes some of the model, like G, the initial GPT model was trained three years ago, was trained on um, 100, 100 to 50 million uh, a billion tokens. But Llama, which is the most recent model, was trained, although it's a smaller, it performs better than initial GPT model, which was trained three years ago. Although it was like um, a much smaller from parameter size, but from token size, it was trained on one trillion token. So that also really helps to do the two parameters. You need to watch out for that. Tokens per second, again, that's again something that is very related to the token size and model size. Performance benchmarks, like you want to see compared to the other models and especially GPT-3 and GPT-4, how good and how bad is that model based on open and public benchmarks. Your GPU specs, sometimes these models are like, one of them is like half a billion, or half, a, half, a, half a trillion, I'm sorry, half a terabyte size. You cannot host it on a very small GPU, right? You need to be considered of how much GPU you have and then decide that. And finally, your use case, right? That's also another thing to consider. And I think I have to pause now, right? So I'll, I'll pause and uh, open up to the question. I have like a few more slides, but again, uh, I'll send it like an appendix after that to the team for you to watch. Thank you. Awesome. So now open it up to questions. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. So something very interesting about these current large languages, especially like GPT-4, for instance, we are treating this like a biological entity. So literally in the MSR, for instance, other research institutes are basically exploring what it can do because we don't know what are the capabilities. Every day we come with a use case, which we didn't know it was possible, with like certain tweaks on the, on the prompts, suddenly becomes available. But some of the things which are some uh, which are uh, the use cases which are not something to start with, and that is like arithmetic operations. This is like a math engines, for instance, to just perform very complex math arithmetic operations and get to like 20 decimal points, for instance, 30 decimal points. That's not something you want to trust the results of the GPT models, and that's something we always say don't use that to get to the arithmetic. The other thing is um, if you want to use it for um, a, use cases which require regulatory requirements because again we don't have access to the weights we cannot really explain the model from a model explanatory perspective that's something you cannot use it today because again it's not available and if it was available it was super super massive so it become really complex um, but um, the other thing is ruling uh, basically the planning so there were some studies if uh, how many of you have watched or like studied uh, the paper called spark up agi Okay, awesome. So there's a YouTube actually, it's basically a presentation of the presenter who actually wrote the paper, uh, Spark of the AGI uh, on GPT-4, like an MSR, Microsoft Research basically paper, um, where like lists some of the capabilities which you can do and you cannot do. One of them is planning. So you cannot really trust the planning aspect of GPT-4 um, like for very complicated operations. So you cannot ask it to just basically plan a very complex application to be written. So that's something that you need, to, you need to watch out and avoid, and as well having a human in the loop to be able to navigate it. So it would be great if you have a like senior developer ask it to just basically ask it to write code, and because that person can capture what is wrong, what is correct, and can navigate a conversation in the planning because it's, it's poor in planning, for instance, now at this time. But how it's going to evolve in the future, we don't know. So that's something that every time like in GPT-2, for instance, there were like so many papers that limitations of potential GPTs or like uh, transformer architecture, and they were trained to be wrong after like a couple of years. So it's really hard to predict in the future what's going to be next iteration, but today these are the limitations. Yes.
Oh, how easy it is to integrate with a tool? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So the question is how easy it is to integrate this with a tool? Because it is sits on top of API, like for the open AI, for instance, literally like just an API call. That's it. So not nothing else needed. So you don't have to come from data science background to be able to use that. However, I would argue that it would be good to have a data scientist in line because data science can validate the result and statistically identify whether this prompt is good or not. Uh, but literally everyone who can access to API can just inject it into your application and just basically uh, infuse it inside your application. Nothing is needed. For open source models, it requires some extra work because you need to host it, you need to deploy it. Um, but again, that's like that extra step. But after that, again, um, you can access it, deploy it on a endpoint or like a GPU endpoint and then access it through your application similarly. Yes. And that's something that probably you need to ask like OpenAI to answer that because that's like a very deep uh, thing that they haven't exposed. But something that I've heard from Lilia, the chief scientist of OpenAI, is that they actually use experts to come up with the data and they use ML, like in GPT-4, to come up with the answers and basically generate data itself. So it becomes like an AI assistant kind of a labeling, not just a labeling. But at the beginning, probably they required an army of people, and now they they become more selective because of the high quality data they need to have, and basically became more more and more selective. And probably in the future, um, again, uh, they become even more expert. They will probably see like some advertisements of like hiring lawyers or like grad students to come in and basically become like a knowledge provider to the models. Uh, but uh, still humans are important because you need to dump the information from a knowledge of a human to the model. So that's probably still important needed uh, for foreseeable future. Thanks. Yes, please. Yeah, that's a very good question. So right now, um, so the question is, um, so now you have to articulate or you have to explain what you want the model to do and how you can make it basically simpler. So you don't have to like become expert in English, for instance, to explain that to a model and like a five-year-old person can also explain that. Uh, so today, prompt engineering is something needed. So, uh, but probably in the future becomes like less important. So model can understand what you mean. Um, but that is the, barrier to entry still. So it means that you have to be able to articulate yourself. And the better you explain, the better result you will get. Um, and that's still a rule of thumb for, for these large language models. Um, in terms of the data, the data is actually, the, the more diverse is the data is the better for the training and the fine tuning. Like for instance, the LLM models basically are like the open source LLM models. You can basically see what type of data set they're using. There are like some of the common crawl of the web or basically some of them are like human feedbacks that they have been provided to the, to the to, to make it more conversational. Um, but at the end, basically everyone is chasing to get more quality, high quality data because the better is that you don't want to build a model on a random Reddit tweets, right? A random Reddit basically rants about something. You want to be highly qualified by saying highly quality data of experts in the field instead of like some of those random rants. So that's very important. And probably over time, as the model gets more expert in understanding that, that prompt gets simpler, but it's still, and it also like if you compare like GPT 3.5 friends with GPT 4, the explanation becomes much basically less important. Still is very important, 
but it's not as important as it was. So it was able to understand you much better than uh, GPT 3.5, for instance. No worries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If there's one final question, maybe we can take it there. Yeah.